It doesn't get much better than that right now. Paul's got a new one on order, but yeah, if we'll need all lights off, we might even want the window closed. This is not a requirement of ever treating this case. No, I don't think it makes a requirement. And it says the education side and the physics side of friends, so it does somehow involve some sort of education. Okay, probably it's time to start. Um, um, let me 
open this uh, seminar by uh, permission of uh, physics seminar coordinator, Professor Alexander Wagner. So, um, if you came for science, it was really the work, the two points of attraction. And um, um, today's uh, speaker um, is a special speaker in the sense that uh, it is a big um, rare opportunities and big honor from the Department of Physics to uh, represent us at the early stage of the career, which is uh, what uh, departmental centers are typically done at later stages. So today's speaker is very student of the Department of Chemistry. Not chem um, period. materials, uh, nanotechnology, uh, also partially affiliated with the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. Unfortunately, he joined uh, MBC in 2017. And immediately started a research program in uh, studies of copper new materials, uh, red color perovskite. So he was uh, presenting his uh, results on uh, more than half dozen scientific uh, conferences and uh, did uh, four or five uh, four separate papers. This uh, uh, last one. Which is uh, highly competitive and corresponds about the physical level records in the physics community. So, um, and, uh, in recently, he focused uh, his attention on um, the new class of phenomena in this uh, materials, um, so called polarons, or it is not new generally for semiconductor. New, uh, new topic for all this kind of materials and uh, famous stuff is um, interesting. So everyone of his ideas is to go to follow and uh, ask questions and the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction and thanks for uh, the students department for the invitation to um, talk to everyone here. As Dimitri said earlier, I am part of the materials and nanotechnology program on campus and my undergrad background in materials and nanotech as well. I mostly have a, an applied physics focus to most of the materials research I do. And I like to, well, since my graduate degree, I didn't, wasn't uh, in computational too much until I got accepted into the Dimitri's group. I had more experimental background. And I also do some experimental background with Dr. Hobby's lab on these materials too. So basically what I like to do is compute, compute and measure interesting observables for photo excited Space. So you can see we have, we have a photo excited electron hole, and there's possibility of if you're in a semiconductor, if you get excited above the band gap, you could have a carrier cooling, so it's dissipation of uh, excess energy to the band edges. And controlling this is interesting for materials such as photovoltaics or LEDs. For LEDs, you want to manipulate them to do a very fast carrier cooling to the band edges. And whereas photovoltaics, it's advantage to have extended carrier cooling. So that's one reason to want to model carrier cooling. And radiative and non-radiative recombinations correspond to like how efficient the light energy can have. So generally, if you're looking for something that is very bright, you want something that has very slow non-radiative recombination or very fast radiative recombination between the states. So you can get, so you put in 100 photons of, of uh, energy, and then if it's 100% efficient, you get out. 100 photons back out, but you can also have some non-radiative decay too, so that's kind of where we're going at here. And so the title of this presentation where we're going to be going is previously published, or in the previous publication, we showed that if you use perovskite nanocircles or materials, you can have a slow carrier cooling in the, towards the band edges for a photo excited electron. And the slow cooling corresponds to a region where it could be Manipulated to perhaps invert it into uh, an IR emitter because you have the right energetic gas and you have the slow cooling, so it might be possible to have the rate or the rate of recombination time scale to be competitive so you can turn it into an emission source potentially. And so that's what we're trying to do with the polar model in this paper. And so this is just a broad introduction that will be guiding through the rest of the presentation. So, introduction, 
what are nanocrystals and why do we care about them, and some simple physics to understand them. So general reasons to care about them is they can be used for a lot of technology purposes. They're very versatile, so a lot of the popular nanotechnology devices that you can make them in solutions and plasma them in thin films. So you can make LEDs for light emitters, photovoltaics. People are also looking into using these charge sources for battery anodes. If you have energy devices, you can use them in sensors. If you have a nanocrystal, it has a large surface area to volume ratio. So if any sort of molecules that have to go around the surface, you can get enhanced uh, signal out of them. So for bio signaling, or other types of sensors that they possibly use for it. And there's also research into, uh, you can get long enough coherence times in the nanocrystals to use them as well. Quantum, so quantum information is qubits as well. So there's a lot of technologies that they can be potentially used for. And lead halide cross guides. Uh, people have been looking into using them for all these applications. And so this is just the general idea of polymer gas, cesium lead halide perovskite nanocrystals. And so this top panel shows that they're made in solution, so they're full of suspensions. And this is just a general outline of how they're made. And these two craters come from uh, Dr. Hobby's lab, where uh, I'm. So this is what immediately after you uh, you make them, which is a suspended solution, you have to purify them a little bit to get a nice clean a sample of the nanocrystals. And you can see just from ambient light, you can get pretty intense emission out of those because they do emit from them in the green spectrum. And this figure just shows the general crystal structure of these materials. So uh, the crystal structure is called perovskite. It's a type of mineral that people use for a while. And this is just the general mineral structure where the lead atom occupies or is coordinated to halide ions. Octahedrally, so lead in the middle and then capital. In this case, bromine, we have other halides as well. And the and these big red ones, those are just space fillers to make the crystal structure. So that's what you see here, guys. And so the first paper to publish about these came about in 2015. Or they were the first ones to make nanocrystals out of materials. And they found that. These materials are very versatile because they have very narrow scale line work. They have a high quantum yield. They can tune the color spectrum or the emission spectrum of these materials by changing halide content and quantization. So this figure is from this paper. Or the original paper on these materials. You can make colloidal solutions spanning all the way from 400 to 700 nanometers. And then you can use this. And then this just kind of showing the line work. All the possible color schemes you can make. They have very fast lifetimes, which is good for having uh, high quantum yields, 50 to 90 percent. And then this figure sh shows potential applications for putting these using these quantum dots for uh, television displays. And so this kind of piano-looking figure is, uh, I'm not exactly sure how it's made, but it's used to standardize like color purity for television samples. So these white dotted lines correspond to to the current limitations for like the current usage for TV or color purity samples, and these black dots on the outside show up from the perovskite sample, and those indicate that they are very high color pure samples, which just comes from their very, very narrow line width. So you can get intense green, intense blue, and intense red. So you can make very good LEDs out of these. And yeah, this just shows since 2015 we have. Insane amount of citations, so it's a very popular field to be in. And so that's just a background on perovskite nanocrystals. And so one way to, if we're going to be modeling excitation dynamics, we want to have an idea of what the photonic structure of these materials look like. And essentially, they are just cubes or particles in a box. So a simple physical model. So if you consider like Bloch wave functions for a periodic semiconductor. So you have your periodic uh, atomic potential with your plane waves. But once you go down to particle in the box, your plane waves essentially just turn into expanding waves. So it's a sine function. And your wave function have your typical solution for particle in the box. And you can interpret the energies for photoinduced holes and photoinduced uh, electrons using particle in the box uh, solution or approximate them. So this color figure shows a valence band where you have occupied space, and then these 
very narrow figure to fill the density of space in your particles. And then these boxes just fill what the wave function or the envelope function. So you have your particle in the box, and then you have for your lowest excited for the lowest figure, you expect spherical symmetry. And then your next band, you expect helical symmetry. And so we'll come back. Questions? Yes. When you make particles and blow up, uh, what exactly does this mean for the of R? It is a part of the kind of R. You would discuss the length of R. Well, it's just a periodic event. So it's like the atomic flag site. You, you mean the atomic function in the vicinity of Yeah, like atomic orbitals. Site centered atomic orbitals. Essentially, it's how you make those. So it's still bigger than the particles in the wall. Not literally. So you can. So these don't show the, the U part, they show the envelope function. But if you, if you made this transparent, you would have a quickly oscillating part. So this, these plots just show the envelope function. Whereas if we wanted to do the view of rent, they're complicated, so we use software to compete with those ones, which we'll get to. So it might not seem relevant now, but I just made this slide because I'm going to call back to it later. Lots of slides. Is it slides or not? Yeah. The um, equation before the arrow is for Bulk equation after arrow is after applying the time. Okay. Is there a picture of it that you said it's not really a particle in the box? What is the unique of the kinetic energy of the picture? Well, if it's neither of the particles in the box, then the wave function is proportional to the time to the R, which is P, so you quantify it using the energy of the picture. Okay. So, so let's just considering if you put photo excited carriers in a box, and then typically nanocrystals they're more covalently bonded, so they don't have ionic charges in them. But these perovskites are a little bit more unique because they're polar crystals, and so instead of excitonic contributions being more dominant in these, it's going to be polar on. Or polar on may be more prevalent to form in the excited state than excitons. And that's mostly due to the very high dielectric screen in these materials. So Coulomb interactions decay very quickly, so electrons and holes are going to be screened by the collided sites compared to being on top of each other. So this so that's just comparing what these these two figures here are comparing. And so if you have very little dielectric confinement or small dielectric confinement. You have a photo excited electron in a hole, and they can be more or less delocalized, and they can interact with each other. While these lattice sites are charged, they don't move very much from the equilibrium. So, compared to if you have polaron formation, you can see that these electron and hole states become a lot more confined. So, if you have your electron here, you're just going to be pulling a positive nuclei towards it more than repelling negative excited nuclei away, and vice versa for the hole. And so, essentially, what that does. In their spatial coordinates, is it uh, localizes your charges into two distinct regions? And notice that these bound, or you consider them as bound states, and they have these lines represent uh, like electronic um, electronic states for the bound polaron. And so this is just kind of a introducing the idea of polarons in these perovskites. And so the Hamiltonian for polarons in general, if you want to think about how to describe, describe the electronic structure of these, is the Froelich Hamiltonian was the first Hamiltonian used to describe these, and this was back in 1950, and so it's second quantization form. So basically it's made up of three parts. You have your on-site electronic states, you have your independent uh, phonon modes, your ESC, and you have the cross-turned electron phonon. So you put the charge in and it interacts with the nuclei. So that gives this cross term here. And so the on-site energies, those correspond to 
some of you are just electronic energy, so energy bands create phasing of momentum and energy efficiency. So you just create a state with a certain uh, energy value. And same thing with your phonons. So you have um, your phonon momentum is banded with heat. It has a certain energy and occupied. And then your cross term, this is just the matrix element of the cross term. So you have an electronic state interacting with the phonon state. And for these solutions, the analytical solutions are very hard to come by. So most, a lot of solutions, they use perturbative or variational schemes. So it introduces this alpha parameter, which people use to characterize the strength of the electron phonon cycle in these solutions. And this kind of indirectly determines the, like the size of the phonon. And so, instead of looking into analytical solutions to these, because I'm a pretty simple guy, and I haven't done line and path things, so it's kind of hard to understand the literature on this, but a simple way to understand the bounds of electronic states in these polarons is just to consider Coulomb interaction. And so this is from a paper by Walter Cohen back in the 1950s. Basically, the point of this paper is that he found that if you introduce an electron or a hole, into a semiconductor. You can reformulate the many body problem into an effective mass problem. So basically, you just have an effective mass with the Coulomb interaction. So that describes the electronic state of the added charge interacting with the nuclei around it. And so, any sort of Coulomb problem, we know what the solutions to those look like. They're going to be analogous to the hydrogenetic, hydrogenetic solutions. So, if we have our polar on bound states, that's what, that's what these represent. Is one, this represents the one over R potential. And these bands represent polar on electronic states in the confinement model. You could approximate the, or think about these just similarly as you would for a hydrogenic solution. And the energy spaces for each of these states would be some sort of scaled version of uh, the right energy. Uh, the energy of your lowest uh, hygienic space. So maybe the, maybe the term nuclei is the best term because nuclei is just made up of the like it's not just the nucleus it's the nucleus and the valence electron yeah. atoms around it and so some atoms they can take it out an extra charge and so in the latter it's still at an overall nucleus so for polarons can you be created they evolve or total excitation. Charges can be injected. Either by plasma and, uh, and 
continue to consider those forms of apparatus to the inject charge. And so consistent with those forms of the injected charge to the change in the nuclear. And that this form is your effective form. In some communities that is effective form or effective electron, you can use the word form. Yeah. And that will create this hybrid that you have to exactly. And so it becomes bound. And it just looks similar to the problem. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you, you can have a uh, strong pull around a whole program of the band mm -hmm. the system. Um, I'm just going to curious a little bit um, about the same hydrogenic that you use here. Because when I think about uh, hydrogenic play, I'm thinking about, let's say, silicon loaded aluminum, or silicon loaded phosphorus. Right? Mm -hmm. It would be a very subtle impact near the band. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the wavelength, then it's very standard, very reasonable level. So when we think about polar, we think about lots, you know, much more localized wavelength. So well, I guess I'm, polar. I'm a, little, a little bit confused about the equivalent between that um, polar and wavelength thing and the wavelength thing. Oh, maybe you are right. Okay. So there is so polarons you can have a lot of different sizes, so there's different regimes. So the ones in these materials, like experimental, that they're very large, like nine nanometers. So it's so it's not a very balanced state. So it has a deeper well, or not it has a shallower well. And in, in these, um, I guess I'm not sure of the exact binding energy, but just from initial computations, it's around one eV binding. So it's so it's stronger than like a, a dopant impurity, but it's still less than the hydrogenic. So it's like, it's in the in-between, yeah. essentially. And so, so we can have electronic states introduced due to a polaron. And the people are researching these in the 60s, looking for solutions. One paper I came across found that for an appropriate coupling bending, in the paper they found from like 2.5 to 6, that these bound states are stable enough, so if you so you can treat them perturbatively compared to like any sort of excitation that you're doing. And so since you can treat uh, transitions between these polar states perturbatively, perturbatively, you can determine rates between these polar ionic states using essentially Fermi's dopamine. And so for this presentation, we'll be talking about. Or this illustration here we thought is uh, simulating like absorption spectrum. So you can have a series from this polar on ground state to this relaxed excited state and so forth going on. Or you can even have then coupled to conduction band states. So you can also have non-reactive transitions. So if you have photo excited, it could cascade down to you. And so this is essentially what we're going to be trying to be modeling with our atomistic models. And this figure just shows experimentally for a close cousin material, which is what you're looking at. So they have a different, a little bit different chemistry. And it's a uh, on nanocrystals, they're thin film. But they do pump probe experiments to look at time resolved IR spectrum. Here. So essentially, the simple idea is they pump it so they photo excite it at a high energy of QVB to create the photon. And then they probe it with uh, IR frequencies to look for absorption characteristics. And just due to the different chemistry, they see a temperature dependence to polar ion absorption. But their, the results from here indicates that they do see polar ions in these materials. And so the next slide just kind of outlines, based on everything that we've done over here, what we're trying to model for dynamic tuning systems. And so our atomistic model, what we want to do is model the photo excitation from the conduction band, our balance band to conduction band, monitor the carrier cooling to what's called in the literature usually the polar on the elastic side state. And you can have two different ways. You can have an electron or a negative polar on, what's called the positive polar on. And then once they relax to these 
relax the tidy space. We want to try to determine the non-radiative range of transition between relax and tidy space. So there's polar on surfaces. And so this is like our end goal for what, how we, what we want to model. So we're going slowly and a little bit more methodically. So we break them up into just a negative polar on and positive polar on first. So we, which we'll see later in the presentation. And so just some methodology for how we I would feel a kind of spectrum for the interior. So we have to use non-collinear functions or DFT please, and I'll explain that in a second. So basically what this equation does is it sums over spin states for the materials and gets a some material we get spin mixing, so spin is not a good cloud number anymore. And so the solutions to this non-collinear one electron equation is a spinner function or a spin, a spin orbital. And it's just a two-component vector that's made up of a spin alpha or a spin beta, and spin alpha, spin beta components. And they obey the usual rules that you'd expect for a good orbital. They have normality and orthogonality. And the reason that we have to use non-collinear orbitals is because in prospects they have a big relativistic effect due to the light orbitals that experience large spin orbital coupling. And so within the software we have to use the incorporate a relativistic effect. So you have special relativistic effects in spin orbital coupling. And spin orbital coupling is the big one because those lights the has a very high angular momentum space. So that's what this L represents, the mixing of angular momentum with the intrinsic spin. And so that's why we have to use spinners, so because the spin states are there. And this will have important consequences for the uh, electronic states and kinetics in these materials. So those are the orbitals, and then these are the observables, or the ground state observables we can use. So our density states, we can use absorption spectra using the spinners, so we can do the transition dipole between our two orbitals, which feeds into oscillator strength, and oscillator strengths are just a, a probability of photoelectrification between these two states, due to coupling to electromagnetic kind of field. And you can make an absorption spectrum from that, and then I'll just note that from the oscillator strength, we can see the radius of our time using the Einstein coefficient, the spontaneous recombination. And so, so that's a charge neutral model, so with no polaron. And then to model electronic structure of polaron, we do the same calculation. So we start from a neutral model. And so that's the independent electron, electronic energy and atomic energy, or phonon energy. So that comes from a charge neutral configuration for n electrons. And to approximate the cross term, the electron phonon couple, we either add or remove charges from our model system or add or remove uh, electrons. And then we let the model optimize with delta R, delta R around the neutron. And so it changes the uh, atomic position due to the neutron. And so that's how we approximate the polar formation. And then there's a similar group earlier, a reporter did too, that uses a similar methodology. As we do, and this is just an example for the positive polaron. So we remove one charge, so we create a whole state, and then we just re-optimize the model around that charge. Mm -hmm. So you put in the orbital states. Change occupancy. Why? Why do you make it a charge? And uh, what do you feel when you fix the orbital? So that's the end goal. So that's a, the to model photo excitation. That's what we'd have to do. But we're doing we're doing it piecewise. <clears throat> so we do so we can imagine injecting a hole, and then eventually it becomes a positive polaron. And then we also compute uh, doing the opposite. So injecting an electron in the conduction band and it forms a polaron. And then so we're gonna get two independent models for so we can see how the systems observe independently. 
As soon as you as soon no interaction between electron polar and polar polar. Right. So we're just trying to isolate if we do see emission from these states, whether it comes from the whole polaron or the positive polaron or negative polaron. So we're just so we just do this to be systematic. Intentionally exclude any possible that you could be objects and look for purely positive polaron, purely negative until the next step is to sort of slide through if we can say that. And so, so those are the orbitals that we use to compute some observables, and then I'll just go over how we model the dynamics of these systems. And so. So we want to model electrons and phonons interacting with each other that give rise to heat dissipation. And so if you do that, or if you set up the Schroeder or the time-dependent Schrodinger equation for that problem, eventually what you run into is this a cross coupling term here, which is called non-adiabatic coupling. And essentially what it does is you have two different electronic states, I and J, and due to time evolution of the nuclei, it uh, mixes them. That gives rise to heat dissipation and non radiation effects in these systems. And so this is just a Dirac notation. And then this term here is just showing you know, a spinner, showing how we're using spinners to compute the non adiabatic coupling. And just to emphasize that we, so we updated time step for the one orbital and compared to the previous orbital. And so and whatever overlap that they have. Kind of proportional to the transition rate between the four orbitals and between the two orbitals. And so, and so this is the, the most competitive aspect of the model that we do. So, this is first developed in the group in 2018, and then and since perovskites require the spin orbital formation, we've, we've applied it to, to modern perovskite systems. And so, so, that's the novelty behind that. What we do to convert these non adiabatic couplings into rates is there's just a standard procedure of taking an autocorrelation auto function of the non adiabatic coupling. So you measure essentially how fast they keep over here. And then you take Fourier transforms and convert them into rates. And then these rates we incorporate into what are called red field tensors. And so this is just a, a density matrix theory that describes the electron phonon. And rates of heat dissipation. And so this red field tensor provides the dissipative transitions for the density matrix. And this is just the time evolution of the density matrix from the Louisville time equation. And another thing to note is for non radiative electrons, we can approximate the non radiative recombination with just the, the matrix element corresponding to the homo lumo transition or whatever non radiative transition we're looking for. And just to give an idea of what this red field tensor looks like, so it's basically just a matrix. So corresponding to matrix of orbital i's and orbital j's with matrix elements, so that's what the z axis represents. And the height of these bars represent the rate or how fast that the transition occurs between two electronic states. And so essentially, so this block right here corresponds to homo minus 24 to homo. So that essentially uh, determines how fast holes accumulate. So hole cooling rates, and then these correspond to the conduction band states. So these describe how fast an electron accumulates. And so those are the rates that are used to compute excited state dynamics. And so now we'll get on to the results, which hopefully should tell a story of how we got to modeling polarons. And so I didn't already introduce the model before, so this is the atomistic model that we use for our calculations. And so it's a, a Proskite 
unit or lattice essentially. So two by two by two lattice, and a certain number of atoms. And then the past phase, the surface trap phase, or like this would be very stable by itself and you just surpass it. And so we just terminate each of the surface lattice and put the certain type of ligand like this. It kind of balances the charge. And same for the bromide. And these ligands correspond to what's seen experimentally. So this group, this would be like a white hat and a wheel on these. You just do the camera. And so a total number of atoms of about a thousand and about twenty eight hundred electrons, so it's a very massive model. So quite a bit of computational power. Just a note on the, how we do our calculations. So we use VAP software, the annual heavy instruments software. And VAP uses periodic boundary conditions. So by default, it uses uh, plane waves, which describe the valence electrons. And it uses two to potentials to describe four electrons. And then we use a PDH functional. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's seven, seven eighths of the vacuum. So it's yeah. So they should be decoupled from each other. Seven angstroms. On the monitor, it looks like it. Is. And so, so we optimize it, do calculations, and so this is what the corresponding density of states for this model looks like. And so. Compared to the particle in the box, or a popular particle in the box we saw earlier, so you see that these, uh, near the band edges, it shows distinct peaks, which are similar to S, P, D bands. So that's what these uh, labels correspond to. So S, P, and H for the hole, and vice versa for the electron. And so this is the presentation. The important thing to notice is for the conduction band, it has a very uh, I guess sparse, very low density of states. Near the band edge, and that's due to the very strong spin orbit coupling. Because if you don't include spin orbit, it's, or I guess it reduces the band gap by 0.7. So basically, it just takes the density states we have there and spreads them out to the number of larger energy states. So just because um, uh, there is a predominantly um, P space on chromium? Yeah, or from, from the left. So all the conduction band states are wet P, yeah. at 6 p.m., and they have very yeah. high angular momentum. The spin orbit is actually stronger. Mm -hmm. It's not as strong as the So, yeah, they have low density states, and the energy difference between this SE and PE state is about, for our model, it's about two PV subgaps, so that's fairly large if you consider thermal energy, which is about 30 milli EV. That's one side of it. Yeah, so this would be 200. No EV, so thermal energy is going to be smaller than that. So you anticipate that you might see slower cooling just because you have a mismatch between thermal energy to, to populate that state in the subgap that's there. So here, um, so you can see that this state has polar on it then? No, this is charge neutral. So this is. No polar on yet. Yeah, so maybe. So this is work that we've already published. So just a charge neutral model. And then we're working towards the polaron. So it'll be a couple more slides for the polaron. And then, so it's a ground state electronic structure. And then just to make the connection back to the particle in the box, so in this left, so the box represents like the boundary condition. And the sphere on the inside represents the envelope function for a particle in the box. And we can't see, or we don't compute the periodic part. Batch variance. But for our initial calculations, we look at the orbital, so this is the corresponding orbital for the low excited state. You can see, I guess, the plane or the standing wave in symmetry here. So this is the model in 3D. So and then what this figure shows is the density just projected on the 2D. So we just integrate over X and Y. So you can see this would be the U potential. Here and then it's not plotted, but you can imagine an envelope function that goes around that. And so, yeah, it's just helpful to know that 
at least some of the orbitals in these models obey like symmetry. And symmetry is kind of important because you kind of have a guess of what transitions and some properties of these materials will look like. Mm -hmm. Or will what would happen just based on symmetry. And so that's ground states. And so we'll move on to excited state dynamics for this model. Let everyone slide on it. So there's a lot going on here. But basically what this figure represents is the theory of cooling in time. So this is a log scale. So negative three or three of them is one tenth of a second. And then zero is one picosecond. That's usually the time scale that cooling is right now. And the green represents uh, charge neutral background. So ground state. The yellow represents non-equilibrium charge density, so you have a photo excited electron. The blue represents a hole of density at these energy states. And the lines just correspond to energy expectation values due to the changes in population over time. And so for both these models we see fairly fast hole cooling. It occurs on 100 femtosecond time scales, and that's kind of in line with this, with this being experiment. But the most interesting aspect of this figure, it's kind of hard to see on this faint background, but you can see a smear um, as it cools down here, and that kind of indicates that there's population buildup or, or density buildup as it's trying to cool the bandit. And so, a better way to represent this is slightly. We move it over to this plot. And so this is just a dimensionless energy, so zero to one, same time axis. And then this plot here just represents the density of states of this band in the model. And what's plotted is a single exponential tip. So we just tried to fit the decays to a single exponential, and that's the red dotted line. And if you compare that to what's actually computed over here, we see that there's a fairly fast, faster than normal or single exponential decay. And then it gets to a certain point near the band edge, and this uh, decay slows down considerably. And we attribute that to a large uh, mismatch in density states, so a large slump gap, because thermal energy is going to be much smaller than this, this gap, so it's going to take a lot longer for it to cool to the band edges. So that was interesting in stuff we the we mentioned. We published that in JAPS earlier this year. But then if you consider where the density of states are, the energy spacing, and the fact that we have slower non-radiative cooling, an interesting idea would be to utilize the state here and try to manipulate it into being a, an emitting state. Since you have a build-up, you have inverse occupation and so that's where we move on to modeling uh, polarons for these models. And so the two models that we'll be talking about here for today are just positive and negative, so just adding a moving target to our fun dot model. And so and for each model, we break it up into three submodels. And so if you remove one charge for the positive polarons, you get a doublet state. So you have an unpaired spin, which is a doublet. If you remove two charges, you can get the singlet. So two spins, one anti-pair law. And triplets where the spins are long. And then same, same idea with the negative polarons. Add one charge, double it, add two, and you have a singlet or triplet. And so, so this is the ground state electronic structure for the positive form. And so this is the whole density space for the whole model. And the box top region is what corresponds to here. So we want to look at the valence band. So that's where the hole's going to be. And so you can see in each of these figures, so same with double and triplet, the Filled in regions correspond to occupied states, and then these white figures below the line correspond to unoccupied. So that's where the hole is going to be for both these models. And then we can see the same 
kind of see the same possible symmetry state. So you could expect that your full round orbital will be some sort of symmetry. And so that's what the density of states looks like. And this figure shows the computed IR spectra. So between uh, possible obstacle transitions within these regions. And we plot them in wave numbers. So higher, our lower energy is to the right, higher energy to the left. And so the lowest energy transitions for all these models are indicated with the arrows. And we see for the singlet and the triplet, they're basically the same for lowest energy transitions. They're, so they're fairly bright, whereas for the doublet, it's the lowest energy is fairly dark and it's higher energy. So if we're going to look or PL from the system, it would probably be from the single or triple models compared to the doublet. And basically the same thing for the negative polaron. So instead of looking at band spans, we look at induction band occupation. So for single and triplet, we see the occupied regions for doublet is half filled. And the reason it's half filled is each band is twice degenerate. So it takes two charges to fill up the state. And we looked at IR absorption again for these materials. So previously it was at like 500 wave numbers. These are a bit higher in energy for the lowest energy transition. And we see singlet, triplet are about the same again in intensity and energy in the doublet. About the same energy, but it's lower intensity. So it's kind of masked there. But so we see the same trend again where if we were going to see total luminescence, it would probably be from the triplet or doublet configurations. And then for the last couple of minutes, we'll look at the dynamics for these polaron models. And so, so these are similar green figures as the four that we saw. So they just correspond to polaron cooling. And so I put these visualizations here to kind of help interpret what we're trying to model for these. So you can imagine that we inject a hole, like we hook up some sort of electricity, and we just put in a hole to the band span. And eventually, that hole is going to cool to a relaxed, excited state for the polaron. It'll be pretty stable there for a while. And we see both of these models that and the cooling occurs pretty much on the same time scale, a couple hundred femtoseconds. Or, yeah, hundreds of femtoseconds. And yeah, so we see cooling to the relaxed, excited state. And then our next figure you're going to be looking at time resolved, and time integrated emission along that excited state trajectory. So it's the same cooling dynamics, except instead of non radiative transitions, we look at rates of transitions that compete with this. And so if you have a radiative transition that's quicker than the non-radiative, you get the you get counts essentially in this time result spectrum. And we see that early early on in the dynamics, both the models did pretty well at cascading like three separate bands of uh, emission to these states with varying intensities. And one and you can kind of interpret that as you inject the charge cascading of possible optical transitions, and then as you cool further down in the band, you essentially just are just left with one optical transition, and that's what we see here. So this is cooling to the relaxed excited state, and then just emitting until the non-radiative up to the non-radiative recombination time scale. And so the main difference between the singlet and the doublet is the singlet once it cools to the relaxed excited state, the band gap is about like 0.1 eV, and it emits there. Whereas for the doublet, it cools and its lowest energy transition is 0 eV. So it doesn't really emit from 0 eV. And so all we see is just the, uh, the cascading low intensity transition when it cools. And so the last slide is so if we consider how efficient these positive polaron emitters are. And so let's just sum it up in this table. So this column corresponds to the radius of the lifetime, which is just shown from uh, Einstein's coefficients. And 
vapor in the reticular on the inverse microsecond field, whereas for the non radical transition, for, uh, for that little energy transition, they correspond on inverse picoseconds. And so essentially, you just think about how to calculate photoluminous quantities. The radiative will be the sum of radiative and non radiative. And since the non radiative is six order magnitudes quicker, it's a very large denominator. And so you have essentially zero photoluminous quantities. And so that just kind of shows that. We're going to see IR, which is how you come from the negative photon, which is kind of what we suspected earlier, kind of leading into this project. And so, just to conclude, so the previous result we saw there was slow hot electron cooling the advantages that kind of gave the motivation to use the a subgap that caused the slow cooling as an IR source. And just from ground state calculations for the polar on, we see that we do see dry optical transitions for single and double. So it does seem possible that we get photoluminescence from the state, such a kinetics matchup rate. But for the positive photons, it's very inefficient, and we have ongoing calculations for the negative photons, and we're working towards the charge neutral. Oh, Looks like I timed that out pretty well. Uh, so I try to understand that in terms of the language uh, for figures. So the polaron we are talking about is we are talking about some. Um, the uh, impact level at about zero point three G below the balance band, are converted by medium and above the balance band. Right? Um, so then, but it's big enough so that um, you know it's much the value is much bigger than the thermal energy. Right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So by camera cooling, you mean the camera gets trapped at that impact level and it's slowed down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so, in the non-polaron picture, we call that we call that slow cooling. Mm -hmm. But as soon as we or change our model into considering polarons, that transition would become the non-radiative recombination. And so we try to utilize that slow cooling as the non-radiative for photoluminescence. Um, yeah, I, uh... Positive uh, polaron as whole with a little bit of a huge charge that is growing from the other one, right? Mm -hmm. and it's the same for the for the edge. Mm -hmm. So that'll be a negative a negative electronic charge interacting with like a mu ionic field. But if you look from far away, the charge is cold and moderate. So I guess it's just running the same machinery for an anti that coupling, so it's just different charge applications. So the charge neutral is like we would we wouldn't have any oxygen to use in the conduction band when we do our calculations for non that coupling. But when we do the polar on, we occupy the lowest conduction band state. And then do the same 
Now you have it. We're working towards the photo. So, so in the case of Nano Crypto, uh, you have some kind of real-time photo run. Um, uh, do you also have photo run in the case of a bug crystal? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's just, the polar on is just intrinsic to the polar crystal structure itself. So no matter what dimensionality, in some sense, you would expect, there's a possibility to see polar on yeah. formation. Yeah. I guess it hasn't been experimentally shown in perovskite nanocrystals yet, but the, I mean, there's some evidence, well, at least to me, that seems kind of useful to think that there's polar on. Occupations there. Yeah, but, I mean, I yeah. Yeah. Because I'm thinking about whether you know when you go to small uh, system, uh, the chance of the function of the function is that um, rather than losing some small data line, then you do not want to have some or you have even more mm -hmm. So yeah, these would be small polarons compared to what would be seen experimentally. But I guess uh, the best we can do at the no, moment no, just because of the number. I'm not talking about the size of the oh. Of the system in the equilibrium is that you know, one thousand atom and more than two thousand electrons. I think that's the natural law to do it. But I'm thinking about you know when you go to a smaller system, you know, the chance of the that the the some kind of the self gap space, the polar on the space mm -hmm. can be more localized than in the bulk. And that's something you can do that later. Um, Almost there. Okay. Well, the beauty is that it's not 
try to visualize my self here as an IR initially for the team team team. So, um, common vision for creating semiconductors was creating it because of the particle flow, which replicated the open line from induction band to down band. Okay. So, the nickel system is charged with the hydrophobic nickel charge. It's injected. Then it will be recombination of particles and flow that their 